the Eucharist. I say a lot of things about the Eucharist. So this section is just going to be about talking about how the Eucharist is seen in Scripture. Pretty much what leads up to the Eucharist. And so I want to point out three things. First of all, the Old Testament. What do you see in the Old Testament with regard to uh, maybe foreshadowing of Eucharist, types of Eucharist? Well, what do you have? You have uh, the people that are fed by God, right? <clears throat> Gives them nourishment in the Old Testament. Where do you see it? You see it in the desert, right? They're in the desert. <clears throat> They're wandering. They've just had the exodus, right? So they've just been freed, and now they're on their own, right? They've been freed from slavery, and here they are on their own, and they're seeking nourishment, right? They complain, uh, of course. Um, but what does God do? God feeds his chosen people with bread come down from heaven, with manna, okay? Neat foreshadowing where Christ fed the 5,000 with loaves and fishes, and where you could say, us, right, who are the new chosen people, have been freed from slavery by Christ, right, just as the old chosen people were freed from slavery, okay, uh, and now we are in the midst of the world, right, free in the midst of the world. So too the people in the Old Testament were free in the midst of the world, and they need nourishment, and we need nourishment, otherwise the world is going to bring us down, as otherwise the world was going to bring them down. And what does God do? God doesn't leave them alone, but he feeds them. He nourishes them, right? He gives them bread from heaven. And what do we have for us, right? We have us, God's chosen people, who have been freed from slavery to sin, who are now in the desert of the world, are nourished by God. The bread come down from heaven so that we, so that we are not uh, brought down by the desert of the world. Good connection, right? Good foreshadowing, good completion and perfection. Continuing on the New Testament, what do we have? We have Christ in the feeding of the 5,000. And we can connect this in the same way that when the feeding of 5,000 happens, Jesus is there, right? Um, <clears throat> you know the story, the miracle of, of the feeding of 5,000 with the loaves and the fishes. Uh, people are sitting down. People are receiving food, right? It's a great multiplication of miracle. And it's so great of a miracle. Some people want to downplay the miracle. But it's so great of a miracle. People want to make him king, um, Right? He's the, they're, they're all over the place. And it's so great of a miracle that the next day, uh, that night you have the, uh, Jesus walking on water across the sea. But the next day, people from all over the entire region are looking for him. Everyone's heard of this miracle from the night before. And so you have probably one of the biggest crowds uh, in the three years of Jesus' public ministry, the day after the feeding of the 5,000, right? Uh, recognizing it's not some naturalistic, oh, one person Jesus says, let's share, and then everybody shares, pulls out little pieces of bread from their pockets that they have, and everyone's sharing, and then 5,000 people have 12 baskets full of leftovers because they all decided to share their food. No, right? It's a miracle of grace and a miracle of true multiplication, right? And don't downplay the miracle of God. Right? And so what do you have the next day? Everyone's gathering because of this great thing. Everyone's heard of it. And they're like, oh my gosh. And so what do you have? Who do you have there? You've got the apostles, the closest people. You've got the disciples. You've got uh, the Jewish people. right? And you probably have the Gentiles, right? the whole crowd. And so John in his gospel, he writes like this. And he has different groups of people. And so he starts with the whole crowd. right? That includes all four groups, right? including probably Romans and, and other Greek Gentiles from the region. Okay, So what do you have? Uh, at this time, well, Jesus, first of all, says, you, all you guys came, you came just because you want to see another miracle, right? You just want to see another multiplication of loves. You just want me to feed you again, right? That's what he says at first. <clears throat> and he says, let me tell you about the Old Testament, Moses and the manna. And uh, what does John write about? He says, oh, some people start walking away, the crowd, right? The Romans, they want to see something cool. Oh, he starts teaching about some Jewish stuff. We're out of here, right? And they take off, right? But then he continues on. And he says, uh, he says, Moses gave the bread from heaven, right? He saved them. Uh, and you have something here that's like that. And so then you have the Jewish crowd, right? Not, not just not the disciples, not the apostles, but John categorizes them as the, as the Jewish people, right? And they ask the question, well, what are you talking about? Who's the bread from heaven? Who's, who's the new bread from heaven? What's the new bread from heaven that you're talking about? And Jesus starts and he says, I'm the bread from heaven. I'm the bread come down from heaven. I'm the bread of life, right? And eat my blood and drink, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And that will nourish you, and you'll have life. And the Jewish people are like, wait a second, right? Hold on. Uh, God is God, and you're not Moses, right? And I don't think so, right? And so John records that the Jews walk away. Right? Uh, and Jesus doesn't stop, and he doesn't say, hey, hold on, hold on. I'm just, I'm just talking symbolically here. I'm just talking figuratively. 
No, right? To recognize that he wasn't speaking symbolically or that he wasn't misunderstood, Jesus would have clarified, right? He would have spoken. He's got the largest crowd here, and people are saying, oh my gosh, this guy's, you know, this guy's nuts, right? But instead, Jesus speaks more clearly and more bluntly, right? He says, oh, you think that I'm saying, really, eat my, eat my flesh and drink my blood? Well, let me tell you. I'm saying gnaw on my flesh, grind your teeth on my bones type gnawing, right? Jesus reemphasizes it. He reemphasizes it multiple times. And he says, chew on my flesh and drink my blood. And unless you do it, um, uh, you're not going to have it, right? Uh, For I am the bread come down from heaven. They ate the bread and still died. If you eat me, you will live forever, right? And he continues on, I eat my flesh, drink my blood, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And to show that it's not symbolically, he keeps on going deeper and deeper into it to clarify, rather than saying, no, 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 not the case. Right? Very important. And John really shows that it's clear what's going on here, because John says the crowd leaves. John says the Jews leave when Jesus clarifies. John says the disciples, people that are following, are starting to believe in Jesus. John says even they leave because this teaching's crazy, according to them. Right? And then Jesus doesn't say, dang it, I should have changed on my words, right? Or, dang it, they misunderstood me. But he turns to the apostles. That's all who's left, the 12, right? That's it. Out of maybe crowds of thousands, right? There's only 12 left. And he says, not, dang, they got it wrong. But he says, are you going to leave me too? Right? I've said what I've said. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. I'm the bread of life. And I'm saying, chew on it, get it down. Are you going to leave me too? And the apostles say, you know, you have the words of everlasting life. In other words, we may not understand you, but we know who you are. And you must be telling us the truth, right? That's what's going down. And that's the response, right? Um, That the twelve say, you have the words of eternal life. But you have in this passage, so many people leave Jesus because of this teaching, right? The fulfillment and the completion of the Old Testament bread come down from heaven. Jesus, chew on my flesh and drink my blood. And people are disgusted by the imagery, right? What do you have continuing on? The Romans start persecuting Christians because they think that they're cannibals in one instance. Uh, They think they're chewing on somebody's flesh and drinking their blood. So this doesn't go away. This actually is emphasized still in the church years later. Very important fact, right? It's not just some symbol that starts uh, being misunderstood and then they get it right. No, it's continued on through this teaching all the way through the early uh, early years of the church. This is an emphatic teaching of the church that Jesus' flesh and blood are eaten and drunk. They're being killed by, by the Romans and nearly everybody leaves them at the time of Christ. Not just symbolic and not just misunderstanding. He's saying it. They don't believe it, or they don't understand it, the apostles. But what do you have after that? You have, then, the Last Supper meal, right? You have the Passover. And then it becomes clear, and I can see, you can imagine their eyes when they see Jesus saying, take this, and he passes around at the time of the eating of the lamb, the Paschal lamb. He says, take the bread, and this is my body, right? In other words, I'm the new lamb. I'm working a miracle. This is now my body, right? And so it takes the Passover and makes it new. He takes himself, and he is the lamb. And we eat of the lamb, and it's the lamb's flesh and blood. And how? Not by taking his actual skin and gnawing down on it, but Jesus miraculously transforming the bread and the wine of the the Passover meal, where you're supposed to eat the saving lamb. And he says, eat me, the new saving lamb. And there they eat what was bread and wine, but according to the miracle, the plan of Christ is now his body and blood, truly and completely, unless one eats his body and blood. And here he gives great new significance to the Passover meal and the Last Supper event. And we see the fulfillment of eating his his body and drinking his blood. And this is why in the church it was continued, right? That every Sunday, while you have in Luke's gospel, that's what they're doing of the breaking of the bread. And why it's called the breaking of the bread in the early church. That at the breaking of the bread, Christ is present and works his miracles. That's what Luke has on the road to Emmaus. When the, uh, the people on the road to Emmaus, they don't know Jesus is walking with them. But when Jesus says the prayer and breaks the bread, they recognize the presence of Christ and he disappears from their midst. In other words, what's Luke saying? He's saying they recognize the presence of Christ now in the breaking of the bread. That Christ works the miracle and he is there truly, this flesh and blood, that we eat like you would eat of the lamb of the Passover meal. And so you have in the church a new Passover with the new lamb. And we truly receive his body and blood. And that's what saves us. And it gives us nourishment 
for this desert world. So the sacrifice of Christ on the cross where he gives his life, he is the Passover lamb. He's the Paschal lamb that is sacrificed. And that same sacrifice Christ gives at the Last Supper. And so at the Last Supper, we receive in an unbloody manner the bloodied Christ on the cross who has been resurrected in new life.